Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. Our first guest lost his son in the war with Iraq in Basra in 2007. Despite this, he continued to support the war and the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair. So much did Mr Blair value his ongoing support that just a few weeks ago and ten years after his son's death, Mr Blair invited him to his Grosvenor Square headquarters opposite the American embassy. But a funny thing happened to our guest on the way to the studio. He read Gordon Brown's latest book. In Mr. Brown's surprisingly little-noticed new book, he reveals that after leaving office, and indeed after the close of the Chilcot inquiry, luckily for some, he received a leaked document from inside the US government at the highest levels, proving that Washington knew from the start that Iraq had no weapons of mass destruction, thus rendering Mr. Blair's legal and political case for the war null and void. This revelation has had a profound effect on our guest Bill Stewartson, and no wonder, it meant his son died on a lie. Bill Stewartson, welcome to the Sputnik. Uh, this is a painful subject for you. Uh, your book... Uh, vividly makes clear the impact on the lives of you and your family of your son's so tragically early death in the war in Iraq. This revelation in Gordon Brown's book, how much of an impact has it had on you? It's difficult to put that in few words, George, but uh, it's turned everything that led up to that particular day upside down in my mind, and it's one of those things that I never thought would happen, and I'm not sure I'm supposed to carry on without resolving it, George. It's not just that you lost your son. It's that you remained a supporter of the war and you trusted in Tony Blair, so much uh, so that he, he kept in touch with you, he invited you uh, unexpectedly out of the blue, we'll come to why that might have been, uh, to come down and see him. He wanted to stay on side with you because, unlike some other service families, uh, you never turned against the war. And thus, the sense of betrayal must be even greater. It may well be easy to view me as naive or easily led, but I've always been one for accepting the words of eminent people in prominent places. Mm. And I've carried that along for 11 years and been the voice in the wilderness. And to read that book of Mr. Brown's and see that I've been conned is the second biggest shock I've had in my life. You already know about the first one. So in that period, nothing else even triggered or changed your mind a little bit, made you doubt a little bit about the course of the war? Absolutely not. And to put that into graphic context, me and Alex sat and discussed the conflict and me and him saw eye to eye and agreed that it was correct to try and be a part of stopping people being butchered. He was honourable. I like to think I am. I've got an awful suspicion certain people in high places can't look in the mirror and say that. No. I can. Well, you see, if, as uh, the document that Mr Brown has, I know that he has it, it's not speculation, uh, if, if, if that document was known to the US government, w there are only two uh, possible uh, alternative conclusions that we can draw from it. The first is that George Bush fooled the Oxford-educated Tony Blair and allowed him to carry on talking about WMD to the British Parliament, to Her Majesty the Queen, to the armed forces, to the British public, to the international public, allowed him to carry on uh, talking about the clear and present danger, 45 minutes and all that, when he knew that it wasn't true, uh, or, alternatively, 
The Oxford-educated Mr Blair knew at least as much as the imbecile George W. Bush knew, and that therefore Mr Blair was consciously lying to all these people. I know which option uh, I prefer, uh, because I know Mr Blair uh, for decades. Uh, which is your preferred alternative option? I haven't got a preferred option, George, other than having the truth fully revealed, because I am now left with two former prime ministers at direct polar opposites with each other, and my son remains dead. I want the truth, I don't care what it is, although I can't see Mr Brown, he hasn't got the motivation. People have dismissed it as a fit of pique in his book to get back at Tony Blair, mm. which conveniently omits the input from Sir Christopher Mayer, and it's starting to look a little bit dodgy for somebody, and it's about time that these people were taken to public account why didn't Chilcott dig this up, George? Yes, exactly. Well, uh, let's I'm, talk I'm about... With that. I, I don't understand that. A multi-million pound, two-year inquiry, whatever it was. Eight years. Eight years. Sorry, m yeah. my apology. Yeah. I'd have dug it up in that time for one cent of the money. Somebody's hiding something. Yes. And in all honesty, I don't know who it is. Well, look, uh, Gordon Brown is... Uh, whatever mistakes he's made uh, politically, and there have been, uh, he's a very honourable person, uh, and I have known him most of my life. Uh, but leave aside the issue of Brown versus Blair, Sir Christopher Mayer was as close as two peas in a pod to Tony Blair. Tony Blair appointed him the British ambassador in Washington. Mm -hmm. He has never uh, once uh, broken with Tony Blair but he has had no choice but to uh, second Gordon Brown in the sense that he knows about that document too. He has seen that document too. So, uh, as you say, the balance is beginning to shift, even if you're neutral in the Brown versus Blair affair, isn't it? I've tried to be even-minded and fair for 11 years. I've been the voice in the wilderness. I've had some harsh things thrown at me for not jumping on the tabloid media bandwagon because I've always believed in the truth. Nothing's changed. It's the truth that's changed, George, not me. Mm. As long as my son remains dead, that won't happen. And a question I'd like to ask through this medium, what are the British media playing at now in light of this revelation? Why does nobody know about it, George? Yes, exactly. There's got to be a reason for that. And that makes me even more suspicious again. Well, uh, you're right to say that nobody knows about it. You've been on my radio show, now you're on my television show. But you should be on everybody's show. And the book should be being discussed on every news bulletin. Uh, Gordon Brown should be out proselytizing for it instead of dodging all interviews about it. Yeah. Precisely, actually, because he doesn't want to be drawn into a punch-up uh, with... Tony Blair. Have you asked for a meeting with Gordon Brown to discuss it? Would you like to ask him now? I would dearly value the opportunity to represent my son and have a discussion with Mr Brown or anybody else involved in this saga on a face-to-face -face basis. I've worked in warehouses and hospitals as a porter. They're very well-educated, eminent people, and I remain open and able to sit opposite them and go through this any time, any place, anywhere, George. Well, Gordon, I've known you for almost uh, 50 years. Uh, I'm asking you on behalf of Bill Stewartson, whose son gave his life's blood in the Iraq war. He's asking you for a meeting. I think you should give him one now. Why do you think Tony Blair, suddenly out of the blue, 10 years after Alex's death, asked you for a meeting? Why might that have been? Well... And what was it going to be about? <laughs> it, it's probably wise at this point to bear in mind that Mr Brown's book hadn't been mentioned because it hadn't been published at that time. Again, I'm going about me normal, everyday business. A letter turns up from Tony Blair 
what else am I supposed to think? I genuinely accepted that letter as a nice thing to do because I'd never, as I mentioned previously, made noises in the press, whereas everybody else had. I didn't do that. So I took it to be a genuine thing. Little did I know that three weeks afterwards, a book from a former prime minister would come out saying what it said. It's easy to look back on that. I didn't have that facility. I wasn't able to do that. Now, it seems like I was taken for a fool. So that was three weeks later that you found out, yeah? Yeah, that Gordon Brown's book come out, and I now feel as though I was used a bit dim, mm. quite possibly, but I can live with that. What I am is straight down the line and honest, and I really do wish people in high places would afford me that courtesy. I've got nothing to hide, have they? So you met him, finally, Tony yeah, Blair? Yeah, absolutely. How was that, meeting him face to face? I actually found the bloke personable and pleasurable company, to be quite honest with you. Well, he's good at that. Well, <laughs> that's a really huge thing for me to get my head around, that yeah. he's quite possibly sat the other side of his table thinking, look at this idiot, let's put the carrots on the stick and lead him down the road. You know, You Bob, tell uh, me. You, you know tell the, me. The Bob Monkhouse uh, saying that once you can fake the sincerity, the rest is easy. I'm afraid uh, Mr Blair is an actor supreme. Uh, but I think that the, the act is beginning to wear thin. Well, it's probably better I don't answer that on... Yeah. on, on <laughs> On, on in this program, uh, because you can probably guess it. <laughs> I'll tell you what. You make up your mind. Did George Bush know that Tony Blair was going around the country lying to the British people and the British Parliament and the British Queen? Did he know? And did Mr Blair therefore fall victim to a manipulative, deceitful evil genius called George W. Bush, or were they in it together? That's the question here. Do you feel mugged? Do I feel mugged? I feel extremely mugged, and I feel let down that that conversation I had with Alex the last time I saw him, which was the Thursday before he went away and never came back, contained a complete load of garbage because I'd swallowed things which maybe I should have been more clued in to do that. And it's all coming out now after 11 years. And if that's the best the British establishment could do, George, something's wrong. Something's rotten in the state of Denmark, said Hamlet, <laughs> and said we here on the Sputnik. Bill Stewartson, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. Coming up next, Nedge Adamson, or better known as Ali Osman of the East Enders. Welcome back to Sputnik. The BBC soap opera EastEnders has been running for 32 years. Its audience remains in the millions. Our next guest has appeared in the Pirates of the Caribbean and with Michael Keaton in American Assassin. But for me, he'll always be the first Ottoman cafe owner in Walford, <laughs> Ali Osman. Nedge Adamson, welcome to the Sputnik. Let's deal with that point first. OK. Uh, although it was long ago, for me, you are Ali. And I think for most people watching this, you made a real impact in that uh, character. And people still remember you as it. And if they see you in Pirates of the Caribbean, mm. they're saying, that's yeah. Ali, the cafe owner. Is that, that's is that's that how it. you experience it? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. does that bother you? No, not at all. You know, it's just one of those things. Uh, Ali was a great character. He was, he was loved. And then they spot me in something else and they still think it's Ali. And then hopefully I can disillusion them a little bit that I can do a bit of acting and he's a pirate. You know, <laughs> it's part of acting. Well, come but back. they still ask me, you know, yeah. lots of fish and chips or egg and bacon. I don't think it's the funniest thing or a cup it of is. tea. It, it, it's uh, a remarkable uh, thing uh, when I told people we were interviewing you today. Yeah. For them, yeah. you're Ali. Yeah. Uh, now, 
That brings me to my first point. How is it for, I mean, you are Turkish Cypriot, yeah. that's what you played in the show, but there are many other occasions, certainly in my lifetime in the round. I mean, I've lived long enough that they used to black up white men to mm. play black men and uh, black up uh, or redden up white yeah. men to play yeah. com com Comanches yeah. and Apaches yeah. in the Westerns and so on. Yeah. Has that changed now? Is it more enlightened in the game? Yeah, absolutely. I think if they want an Indian character, they will look for an Indian actor. There will never be another Peter Sellers. Mm. So there goes half of my talent. You know, I used to think I could do an Indian accent. I could Peter do... was very, very yeah. good at it. Yeah. I mean, let's yeah. be fair. He's a genius, and, uh, absolutely. He was an absolute yeah. uh, genius. Yeah. That's fair enough. Yeah. But do they ever cast a minority actor for a character that's ethnicity is, as it were, unimportant, not specified in the script? Exactly. No. I think sometimes they, they, they do. I mean, I go out for auditions sometimes for an Italian or an Indian, although my skin's not dark enough. If they, if they want you, they'll just sort of darken you up a little bit. I mean, they're interested because they obviously see my resume or photo mm -hmm. and they think he could play an Indian. So I think if they really wanted to, were you, you the, could get the part. Were you the only yeah. non-British at the time there in the EastEnders? I was for the first year and a half mm -hmm. and then... Um, the Someone guy who played like... my brother, oh, yeah. Mehmet, he was from Turkey, from uh, Izmir, and he played my brother, brother in the show, so... We see, that in yeah. itself was remarkable, yeah. because uh, however you define Walford, yeah. the East End is full of people yeah. of colour. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and yet you were the, that, there was, the only one in the village, as Yeah, it were. there was me and there was an Indian family, Saeed, who they first came yeah. as well, and there was the Tony, the Carpenter family, who yeah. were the... Jamaican was that family. a weakness then in the script, and is that a common weakness in, amongst writers? I don't know if it's amongst writers, but I think... Because it, you can't just blame a writer. It's got to be a, a unified thing, mm. from the director, the producer. They've got to actually be there. I mean, the, the thing is, when the set of EastEnders was built, right, so it's a brand new set, they, the designers came in and they graffitied some of the brand new sets. And when the producers and the top hierarchy of the BBC came, they thought, oh, we've been vandalised. What's happened to the set? Oh, my God, look, this is terrible. We need security. Like, no, no, this is a set design. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you've scribbled all over it. Yeah, but this is the this East is End. The... They've yeah. never been there. They've Amazing. not seen no, no. What, what, how businesses are, how people live, what goes on. And they were terrified. They thought that their whole set that they're spending a half a million pounds on had been vandalised by, you know, the Elstree mob. You know? <laughs> but these are the people that brought us El Dorado, yeah. of course. Yeah. They spent all our licence fee money yes. on building a fictional yes. village in yes. Spain. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest white elephant in television yeah. history. Perhaps we shouldn't yeah. go too far down that. Please don't. Uh, <laughs> In case they bring it back. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> now, you... I mean, you are Turkish, Cypriot, yeah. but you've just been in Greece yeah. in what is, by all accounts, a smash hit uh, comedy. Tell yeah. us about that. Yeah. You're playing a Greek. Yeah, there. I'm playing a Greek barman mm. and uh, with an accent and whatever, and it's a great character, and there's a great team of uh, writers, which is basically their own experiences, because they worked in the tourism business for... 25 years so it's real incidences that happened with real characters and the crew everybody we just it's a low budget at the moment to get the pilot going and it, it just gelled it was just magical it and is there fantastic. any because you uh, come from cyprus is there yeah. any greek turkish tension agro amongst ordinary Greeks and Turks? Well, I have many, many Greek friends. They're like my brothers to me. Mm. So I don't see that side. I don't get involved with the politics of what goes on because I think they're the ones who stir things up, you it's know. It's not the and... film industry neither. Sorry? You don't really have... You don't really see it in the film. No, the, because you... In the no, film, in no. The TV industry. You might have off-camera. You don't know. You don't know what someone is thinking. Mm. Mm. But when, you, when you're in front of camera, I mean, I know you don't like me very much, but you're pretending to like me at the moment. And then say, so I'm joking, right? <laughs> but I'm what I'm saying is, we don't know. <laughs> you were great. I actually, I love you. You did a Eubanks moment there. That was 15 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> like, you know, we don't 15 know. seconds yeah. will henceforth be known as a Eubanks moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'd have to have seen the previous yeah. Sputnik to yeah. uh, get that. I mean, yeah, you, you've always heard the stories of leading lady, leading man, yeah. and it looks fantastic yeah. on film and when yeah. it's edited, but. Yeah. 
as soon as it says cut, yeah. they hate each other. Yeah. And, and 20, maybe these things 20 years happen. later, one of them will be accused of inappropriate yeah. uh, touching yes. during yeah, the exactly. kissing scene. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Now, the, the, uh, but you, you yeah. would like, I know you don't do politics, yeah. but it is a great pity that yeah. Cyprus has been divided so long, isn't it? Yeah, totally. I totally agree with you. Can it, can it reunite? I don't think it will ever be reunited. I think uh, it's been too long. I think there's attitudes that will never change. Um, and people hold on and harp on to history of what's happened the last 50 years or 60 years, and there's no forgiveness. So I just think, myself, I don't think it will ever happen in my lifetime. I wish, I wish it did, because it's such a small island, such yeah. a beautiful island. Yeah, very. And, you know, the Cypriot people are the same people. Yeah. Mm. The only thing is is a Muslim and Turkish and language difference. But my grandmother, she spoke fluent Greek. Yeah. You know, and, and my friends... I know you're a Greek barman, you know, at least on screen. Barman. Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the pirates of the Caribbean... Yes, please yeah. tell us more. I mean, yeah. uh, I take my uh, eldest son yeah. uh, to see them. He loves them. I mean, it is a bit hackneyed now. They've mm. done six of them. Yeah. But they're still worth seeing, aren't they? Yeah. What's the uh, secret of that success? I just think it's just fun. You can escape. It's nothing too serious. And the characters are quite, you know, developed. And uh, everyone some loves Johnny actors, Depp. including yourself, yeah. in them. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, there's some real serious yeah. top-line actors. Javier Bardem was in the yeah. last one I yeah. saw. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as well as Johnny Depp. I mean, Johnny I, Depp I think kind it, of plays, it, always plays the same part for me. Yeah. But he's a big star, no doubt about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. But I think it's like... Like you said, these top-notch actors, some of them want to just have a little cameo or something. Yeah, on. It's yeah. like Hammer all actors want to do a bit of James Bond, you know, mm. just to be in a movie or, you know, a James Bond movie, whatever it is. And I think it's got that uh, attachment to it now, yeah. you know? No, I'm, I'm really keen on the, your uh, new project. I don't uh, know how much you can say. Without giving the plot away. No, it's, quite, it's, it's quite it's, good to it's, leave it's, the viewer uh, guessing. Yeah, because they, they may come and see it, yeah, you know. exactly. But uh, it's based but it's on based a true on story. True story, yeah. And really it's about... Uh, it's, it's changed the law of hanging in this country, and we believe this trial uh, it was a hanging of a Greek woman, and we believe that um, she, she was framed by the establishment and what have you. And so we were just See, that's looking a dark into that, and, and because of this story, yeah, but because of her plight, we believe that it changed the law of hanging in this country, which is phenomenal. Again, another foreigner comes in, and whatever reasons, she 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 dies, yeah. and then they change the law. It's just uh, incredible. Yeah. Just finally and briefly, yeah. you were in the last Carry On film. Oh, yeah. yeah, did it work? Uh, I don't think it was a big box office hit, but it was one of the best jobs I ever had in my life. With Bernard Is this Carry On Columbus? Yes, yeah. Carry On Columbus. And it was, it was just fantastic. It was a, it was a joy. Yeah. Who else? Was there anyone else uh, from Don the Don Henderson. Guard? Yeah. Yeah. And they basically, they, they took me under their wings and we just laughed for three weeks non-stop. It was fantastic. And it then, looks uh, like that. I mean, yeah, it looks like yeah. a funny thing yeah. to do. Yeah. And hopefully also to see. Yeah. Um, I it actually was. haven't seen yeah. it all. As I watched a yeah. clip of it. Well, it was uh, like they had the old comedians with the new wave comedians yeah. and they mixed it. And it didn't quite Not work. Not entirely. But, yeah, but there possibly won't be another one, which means yeah. you have entered legend and history uh, I've again. I've died already again. I'm dying again. <laughs> <laughs> Ali, I mean, no. Yeah, yeah. It's been marvellous. Thank Thanks you for George. joining us. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? So how much has changed in British TV since Ali Osman, <laughs> you know, on EastEnders, in terms of reflecting the multiracial British society? Ricardo Picasso says, it's much better than it used to be in terms of acting, but why don't you read the credits of any UK drama and see how many ethnic di directors and writers are involved? Well, I must beg to differ, uh, though I usually agree with Ricardo yeah. Picasso. When I look at credits, uh, I'm amazed at how multicultural, multiracial they are. And we're even now seeing, as you and I know, as watchers of Snowfall, we're even seeing British black actors 
making it big all the way in Hollywood, in, Hollywood <laughs> in the United States, playing American blacks. Exactly. It's an amazing thing. It is. Now, regarding the leaked documents revealed in Gordon Brown's book and why nobody has still answered it, common opinion says they are not going to arrest themselves, are they? Why are you people so confused about this? These people are wanting for morality, and morality comes from goodness. These people suffer no goodness, but we suffer these fools. Well, you watch this space. I'm teaming up with Gordon Brown, whether he knows about it or not, whether he likes <laughs> it or not. I'm going to take his book to every corner of the world. Watch this oh, space. OK, then. Well, that's all the time we've got for the tweet today. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. But you can stay in touch with us on social media, on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today, or on Instagram and Twitter, RT underscore Sputnik. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.